Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Thank you for taking the time out and being here today. My name is Lori Burris, and I'm the Education Innovation Advisor at LinkedIn Learning, the leading provider of learning online videos. Today, I'm hosting the Future of Education, an interview with Michael Berman, the CIO of the California State University System. Just a little housekeeping. Uh, don't worry, we'll be sending out an on-demand recording of this webinar as soon as it's available. Any presentation decks or additional materials will be sent to you as well. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. We'll bring them up during the presentation and we will also have time for Q&A at the end. I encourage everyone to share on chat and share with each other on any social media and with your audience members. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome and know that we love hearing from you. Today, the format for the panel is a conversation, a dialogue followed by questions. Now, without further ado, we're going to start hearing from Michael Berman, but let me briefly share about who Michael is, because uh, he's a lot of different things. He is the Chief Information Officer for the California State University System. He provides enterprise services and strategic coordination for the 23 campuses of the California State Universities. He recently served as CSU's first Chief Innovation Officer. That's the only thing we have in common is we, had, we at one time both had innovation in our titles. And he's led an effort to promote innovation across the CSU campuses. For eight years, he was a VP and CIO at Cal State Channel Islands and has been the senior technology administrator at three other universities. I'm gonna get into more of what he's doing and what he's all about, but I thought it might be interesting to ask Michael himself, Michael, how did you journey from Rutgers to Art Center to CSU? And maybe you could give us some tips on how to become a CIO. What, was, what's your, what is your career development strategy here? Well, thank you, Lori. First of all, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. And I'm such a big fan of uh, uh, Linda, uh, of LinkedIn. Uh, especially LinkedIn Learning and um, what uh, uh, was brought over from lynda.com. Um, and, and I'm a big fan of yours, so it's really nice and I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. I don't think I could give anybody advice on how to have a career like mine. I, you know, and I don't think you'd want to if you could, but um, it's, been, it's been right for me. Everyone's got to find their own path. Um, I, I started out as a professor. Um, I really wanted to be a computer science professor. Um, I, I had a long, rocky road to get my PhD, but I finally managed to get there. If there's anybody out there who's pursuing that, um, Godspeed and hang in there. Um, but I, I did finally get, get that, and I taught at a state, state college and uh, state university in New Jersey. Shout out to anyone who's in New Jersey or in the Philadelphia area. I was at the Rowan University there, and I was a professor. and. Um, I was just very fortunate that I was there at the t at the formative days of the internet. That's what really drove me into this. And there really wasn't ed tech per se. I go back that long, you know, that there there were there were a few little applications that ran on, you know, Macs and early Macs and on DOS and things and people would build things with HyperCard and and some of the tools that were available then. But it wasn't it wasn't a big deal like it is now, and and there really weren't networks in the same way. I mean, most people were just carrying things around on floppy disks. Um, and um, but but in the early '90s, when I was a professor, their networks were just taking off. And I was, you know, at a, a, at the time, Rowan University wasn't what it is now with an engineering school and all. It, it was it was Glassboro State College, and it was kind of a sleepy place. I don't want to say backwater; that wouldn't be fair. But it was a typical kind of state university state college and you know nobody knew about this networking stuff and i was just so excited because i was seeing it happening at rutgers and participating and and i sort of became an evangelist for the internet at a time before the world wide web and people it was just very mysterious and people didn't understand what it was and that's really what drew me into um into becoming a technology administrator originally because i wanted people to have the opportunity to see this amazing stuff that was happening and and I had students who were showing me stuff. I had students coming to me breathless going, I just talked to somebody and I found out they were in Brazil, you know, and they were so excited. And um, so I wanted to see to see that happen. So I really became involved in, in 
writing grants and, and getting resources to bring networking to the campus and figuring out how to manage it. And through that was kind of a backdoor way to me into becoming a, an administrator. And um, I saw some really bad college administrators and university administrators. I said, well, I couldn't do worse than them. So I think I'm going <laughs> to take a shot at this. And uh, so that was really a path. And then there was an opportunity to move back to California, where I was originally from. And then I've just kept doing it. Um, and I've just had a lot of great experiences, met fantastic people, um, had gotten a chance to work with a lot of different companies and campuses and students. And so it's been fantastic. I've loved it. Um, you know, I, it, it's a cliche, but you follow your passion and find something that it's the circle of what, what you're good at, what the world needs, and what you enjoy doing. And if you're lucky enough to find that, then I think you can have a, a, a and, and find some good manners and um, I think you can have a good career um, and I'll just say at the outset especially easier for me than for some people but um, I think we all have uh, a commitment to um, try to make it easier for those people who have been excluded from those kind of roles so that's another, another important point of it. Well I think you've done that you've been a great networker and you still are a great networker but you're also really good on your feet with keeping up with whatever the new trend or the change is going to be and I think that skill set of being able to anticipate and adapt to change has been one of your key strengths over the, the, the years. And that gets me to what your, this is a more recent project, but something that I personally am very passionate about. I know that you're actively committed in supporting universal broadband access within the CSU system and also externally to any higher education or any student learning. Um, I know that you've just been appointed as a chair of the board of directors for Senec and uh, that you're fostering those innovations. I think a lot of people don't know about Senec and I'd love for you to tell about what they're doing and the work they're doing and how people could sure. be involved in this. Well, um, th thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Laurie. And I just wanna say, uh, acknowledging the chat, say hello to Anthony and Yvonne and um, it's cool to have people here from, from other countries too. And I know LinkedIn has a worldwide reach. So that's very cool. Um, Scenic is the, is the organization that runs the, the academic networks um, for the state of California, and, and its roots are, in, are the same as many other regional networks, other regional networks across the United States. Um, we're fortunate in California, having the, the world's fifth largest economy, um, to have the combination of the vision and the resources to have an exceptionally good state network to support research and education. And uh, Scenic is a world leader in networks, um, and it's, it's really super to um, be part of it. Scenic originally started connecting all the U University of California campuses the and the Cal States along with Stanford and Caltech and a couple of other the uh, large research USC um, large research institutions in the state of California but it's gone on to, to bring in the community colleges the K-12 districts the um, and, and the public libraries which is really amazing so we have hundreds of public libraries across the state of California that are now connected to Scenic. Um, and those of you who are familiar with the challenges that public libraries face, I mean, first of all, public libraries, aside from just being great institutions and important civic institutions all over the world, but certainly in the United States, they often become some kind of the internet access point of last resort for a lot of people who don't have broadband access in their homes. Um, but I think if you went to a lot of public libraries 10 or 15 years ago, there might be some computers online, but they might have pretty uh, poor uh, quality of connection. But now that we're connecting public libraries to Scenic, it's really changing the game. And we have libraries with gigabit connections and more um, 10 gig connections. So Scenic, you know, it, it's some legacy name. It's like uh, Enterprise. <laughs> I, nobody can remember I what Scenic stands for. Uh, we I just, have it written. Now. It's, 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 you can't remember you what go. it means. I'll... Thank you. Corporation for Education Network Initiatives in California. I mean, that's a very old, that's, that goes back more than 20 years. But uh, what it is, it is a, it is a nonprofit corporation chartered by, um, educate, by higher education in California originally that um, connects the state and connects, I, I believe, uh, something like 1,500 or 2,000 sites now in the state of California directly and then through subsequent connections, of course, many more than that. But what's really exciting now is because California has had the vision to invest further in bringing networking to places that are underserved and don't have access. Scenic's now um, in the middle of 
an initiative working with the Department of Technology in the state of California to build out what's called the Middle Mile Initiative. And what that's going to do is provide many, many more miles of connectivity in the state of California, not just by building and adding new fiber, which is expensive and time consuming, especially right now when you might have to wait 18 months to get a bundle of fiber, but also using existing dark fiber that's in the ground and working with um, companies and others that have fiber paths through the state of California. So it's going to add hundreds of miles of more connectivity and really focused on the underserved parts of the state. We got, I, I can see I've got a friend there from Scenic by the links that are being posted. Thank you, whoever that is. Um, so um, um, the, the, um, uh, the result is going to be that parts of the state, either because they're rural, and those of you who aren't from California probably don't re always realize just how big California is and how much of it is very rural. Um, so it's going to reach rural areas, but also importantly, provide new opportunities for connectivity in areas that are densely populated, but have been, been underserved for economic reasons. Um, there just hasn't been enough profit or perceived profit for uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the for-profit industry. Um, obviously, they have to go where they can get a return on their investment. And, um, but there are large areas, even very close to the chancellor's office in Southern California, there are major areas that are very much underserved they don't have the connectivity and they don't have it at a price that most people can afford. So um, it's really about getting, the goal really is to have a high quality broadband connection in every home in the state of California, because that's what you need to get a job, to get educated, to get healthcare, to get legal advice, you know, as, as well as to, to connect with your family and connect with your community. So it's just a, it's a 21st first century basic need um, every family deserves to have decent connectivity in their home so they can fully participate in the economy and in civic life. I think this is so important. And I was so excited when I when you made the announcement because I, I love the idea of partnerships and I love the idea of not just serving the easy people, but serving the areas where it isn't as easy and trying to make equity and accessibility the forefront of, of broadband access. Um, you, we learned during uh, COVID, obviously, you need it for telemedicine, you need it for school, you need it for almost everything. Um, it's what kept, it's really what kept us all afloat during the last uh, two, 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 two and a half years. I mean, I'll so mention another one component of it, Lori, just because uh, I was just yeah, yeah. thinking about it. I, I just didn't want to, to miss it. You know, a lot of people don't know that there's a very, very many tribal lands that are owned by indigenous tribes in the state of California. And you know, many of them are out in the desert, they're in the mountains, um, and many of those areas don't have good connectivity. So this middle mile is also for the first time gonna bring fiber right to the to the gates of those tribal lands so that again, the people there have an equitable chance to access education so that, you know, s somebody on one of those tribal lands can take a, a course at San Diego State University. So I'm um, very excited about that component and building great partnerships um, that are that are very respectful and um, two way with with many of the tribes across the state of California to serve this uh, mutually beneficial need. No, it's 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 a fantastic thing, and I hope I hope it can be a model for other states as well. I, I've been really actively personally in um, universal broadband access and looking at different states, Arizona being one of them, uh, Florida, New York, um, really following some of the big states with have the biggest school systems because I think that's where we can see um, partnerships and strategic leadership making a difference. There's another area where I want to really promote what you are working on and have done for decades. Uh, there's this thing called, I'm not going to even say it right, CSU success or C success, C success, C six, six. Okay. I knew I wasn't going to blow the, the, the pitch C success. It's an important initiative. In fact, I quote you, we believe that every CSU student should have a quality device wherever you came from, whatever your income, whatever group you might identify with. We want to make sure that you have the same access to technology as anyone else. Tell us about this. This, how did you spearhead this? How did you get everybody on board? How does this work? Well, first of all, it was a very much a team effort. Um, you know, it was led by the leadership of the CSU, all the way up to the board of trustees have been incredibly supportive of this initiative. And, you know, one of the observations, I think we, as you say, Lori, you and I, and many others have known this has been important for a long time, but I think it was just highlighted in 2020 when, um, we went through this this massive effort to make learning continue with as little disruption as possible as we moved into COVID. Um, and um, 
we did amazing things, but the reality is no matter what the campus does, no matter what the teacher does, if the student doesn't have access, it doesn't work. And we've saw, seen, for example, in, in our incredibly important community college sector in California, a big drop in enrollment. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, but I'm certain that one of them is that as community colleges said, you know, we're just not able to offer in-person courses for some period of time, you need to get online. That just wasn't an option for many of those students. They didn't have the personal resources. They didn't have the connectivity. Some of them, as I mentioned before, lived in areas where you couldn't even buy the connectivity. Um, you know, for example, lots of people live in, in mobile homes and trailer parks. Those areas tend to be very underserved in terms of broadband access. Um, and if you don't just, have just a home, to tell you, you know, we have- we Yeah, just, tends, just, just yeah. a real life example. One of my students when I was teaching at Otis was taking my online course by going to McDonald's parking lot. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so we know this was happening. We know students were working in their cars. We know we have students who are incredibly committed, but you know, at a certain point, you're trying to live your life, take care of your family, deal with sick relatives, um, maybe doing an essential job. Because if you look at those essential workers, the people who are delivering the, the pizzas and the Amazon boxes, a lot of those are our students. Um, you know, they, they, a lot of them just couldn't keep up and be successful. And, and to be successful is, is obviously, it's it, it really three things, right? You've got to have a device. You've got to have connectivity. And you have to know how to use it. And, you know, if you come from a disadvantaged school, a disadvantaged family where you've never owned your own personal device, maybe you got to use, there was maybe one hand-me-down desktop computer that, that five or six people in the family all share, or maybe the best thing you've got is a five-year-old mobile phone and you use that for your, your online connectivity. You go into the library, well, the library's closed now. You go to McDonald's, McDonald's is closed. Um, you know, people were just really caught out. So anyway, I think this really highlighted that um, having this connectivity is an essential element of student success. And the CSU tries very hard to have the programs and the, the uh, philosophy and the approach that says every student that we bring in can be successful. And that was the, that was the origin of the C-Success program. Um, and so, so far we've, we've, we've gi given um, 29,000 students a device that is on permanent loan to them throughout the course of their educational career. It's not like you get it for two weeks and you get to go back to the library and ask for another one. No, this is your personal device. You use it um, uh, from the time we give it to you until you leave the institution. Um, we hope that that means you're leaving with a degree. That's the goal. Um, so you mentioned that the third thing you've got, you've got now you've got them the internet, you've got them, the, the, what are you guys doing for training on this? Because that was one of the problems that we were seeing in some of the states I've been working with, that the education part was completely forgotten. People were offering the broadband access, offering the device, but not doing any training or education. So we haven't done a lot systematically yet at the CSU level, but there's amazing stuff going on on the campuses. There's many very, very strong initiatives in the campuses. We're trying to learn from those. Um, my colleagues in the academic tech program, uh, in the chancellor's office are working on both on on how we can do more training in general but also especially how we can train faculty to help them be able to think about and be sensitive to how students are going to uh, work with these devices so it's ramping up you know when we started there was just this sense of urgency it was like we can't solve all the problems what can we do fast we can get a device into the students hands and you know and then secondarily in some cases we gave out mobile hotspots which is a solution that is only partially successful, you know, because it depends where you live and where you put that hotspot. We all know if any of you uh, have ever had a time when your cell phone was out of coverage, then you know that a, a mobile hotspot, it's basically a cell phone for data, is not going to work everywhere. So it's not a perfect solution, but um, we have given out about 1,800 in this program and then even beyond the program because there's work in the CSU at campuses that goes beyond C Success, and there's a number of campuses that have their own initiatives that aren't formally part of C-Success, but are doing a lot, they are come out of the same uh, motivation and they're just approaching a little differently. Um, well, we've that, given that... Out many thousands of these mobile devices. Some campuses have even helped students enroll in low cost um, broadband programs. So, so yeah, the so that, lead, 
That leads me to a follow-up question. You've worked very hard in serving the 23 CSU campuses to support technological collaboration as a via system-wide uh, working groups, as well as using common enterprise systems and common network infrastructure. These goals aren't easy to achieve as universities are typically siloed, even in statewide public university systems. How did you get this going? I feel like now, you, uh, when you first started, it seemed like you were climbing Mount Everest, but now I feel like you've got the momentum and, and your, your, your teams and CIOs are on board with this idea. What, well, what was know, the strategy you put in place here? Well, to be fair, this goes back 25 years or more. And, and really, I know <laughs> really to to the visionaries that were in the CSU in the 90s, um, uh, Tom West, notably, and who we just recently lost um, and a number of and a number of other people um, re really had this vision that, first of all, that technology was an essential part of education, which, Laura, you and I know 25 years ago was a controversial proposition. Um, there were people who said, no, it's a, it's a fad, it's a extra, we can't afford it, we don't need it. Distraction. Uh, it's a distraction. I mean, so, some people still say that, but that's not the majority viewpoint now, but that was pr very prevalent 25 years ago. So those are people who said, yeah, well, we get all that, but our students are gonna need access to the technology. This is, this is where so much of the world is going. Um, and, um, so that vision really started then and it's you know it's waxed and waned over time i think the 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 challenge for me as the cio in the chancellor's office is you always want to be helping the campuses and not hurting them right i mean there's a lot of things if if you're sort of ham-handed and thoughtless about centralized initiatives um you can actually just create a lot of extra work for the campuses so and collaboration and sharing takes time and effort um I'm guessing that's maybe is that I'm guessing that's either uh, John or George who put that about new media workshops in uh, in Monterey Bay in 1997 or 98. Um, no, I mean, so so we want to be there to actually do something. You know, as my my friend Jerry Hanley used to say, we want to give you a gift, not a burden. Or um, you know, we don't we don't want to we don't want to hand you a basket of puppies and tell you we've given you a lovely gift. You know, it's like it's it's nice at first, but it's a, it turns out to be a lot of work. So, I mean, the question is, where can we really provide value for the campuses? Because the teaching takes place at the campuses. The students are on the campuses. You're in the chancellor's office. You know, it's a bureaucracy there that that um, is supposed to um, support the campuses and support their success and ultimately the success of the students. It's always about the success of the students. That's what we're here for. And um, so, you know, it's easy to, for me to say, well, we're gonna work together. Let's everybody do this thing a certain way. And if you don't do that by spending a lot of time listening very carefully and understanding what the campuses need, you can actually damage what they're doing or just create extra cost or extra bureaucracy. And um, I'm always about, you know, the bureaucracy is inevit inevitable, but we want to we want to lean it as far as we can towards the service of the campus and the students. And the students. I'll just tell you one one an anecdote. When I one of the first meetings I was when I started working in the chancellor's office as director of innovation, I heard someone say, "Well, that would be better for the chancellor's office." And my thought was, "Who cares? Who cares what's better for the chancellor's office? Because better for the chancellor's office doesn't help a student, right? It's got to be better for the campuses, better for the students." And so that's what I try to remember and what I try to counsel and, and lead my team at. It has to be better for the students. So better for 23 campuses sometimes is not gonna, is, is hard to achieve because they're different. They're right. in different places in the state. They, they to some extent have different student populations. That being said, there's a lot we do that's the same. And sometimes working together might mean five campuses or 10 campuses or 15 campuses. 23 is pretty hard to achieve. Right, but I do think, having worked with your campuses now for, for over 10 years at LinkedIn Learning, that there is the sense that there's success in certain shared commonality goals. And then we also have the ability to go back to our campuses and keep our individual campus culture, um, our, our targeted audience, and sort of the community that we that we work with there. And so I feel like there's a, a good balance there. There's not this feeling that one system the, the top hijacked the bottom. I feel like there's this, you know, uh, I know when you got broadband network for the entire, um, when you had that network system set up for the entire 23, that was huge relief, yep. especially because it, it, it made it equitable. It didn't make your top 
uh, universities who have the largest enrollment be the only achievers in that area. So totally it, it actually, it brought different players to the table that wouldn't have had a voice if you hadn't done that. So really, really, really great work. Now on to some other things you may not know about Michael Berman as I jump around in this interview. One of the things is, you, weren't you awarded like the the educator who did the most Twitters in the, the world or something? Or you I received was in the some- top 20 by someone who made a, or top 50 of someone who made a list, I forget. I don't know whether so that to... was uh, whether I, I actually had that on my LinkedIn at some point and then I took it off, but it was it was fun. But um, uh, some people might say that just to... some people might right. say that's that's um, maybe I should be doing something else with my time. I'm not sure. But no, but I think it speaks to the fact that you've always wanted to make conversations open, yes. transparent and accessible to anybody at any school in any position. Yep. Um, and you put. And you post a lot. You post a lot on LinkedIn. And one of my favorite posts that you recently made was the decision tree for a hybrid world. So I have put this image into the PowerPoint. What is this image all about? Maybe you can run us through this. Sure. I, I mean, this. you look at the date, the date for it, um, uh, January 2022. This was, you know, really as, again, a lot of our campuses were looking at resuming in-person um, activities uh, because most of the CSUs didn't really... Uh, have a substantial return to face-to-face -to -face programming until uh, January, February of, of this year. And I was reacting to some of what I was hearing that was sort of uh, on the line of, wow, we don't have to do this online anymore. We can go back to doing it all face-to-face. -face. And I, I just want people to think intelligently about why do, why do it face-to-face, -face, right? And, and Believe me, there are things I love doing face to face. I love spending time with people. I love working on projects face to face. I love going to face to face conferences. You know, you, I'm a, I'm a pretty social person, and and the last two years has been very wearing on me. In times when I just felt like I couldn't get out, and so I felt that. But I don't want to be a decision maker at a campus who's bringing all this, telling all the students they need to come back just because I'm lonely, right? Or <laughs> or because or because you've done. That's the way we've always done it. Or because I'm panicking um, uh, about the finances of the, of the campus and I figure that, I mean, campuses have really legitimate concerns. I mean, just think about it, right? If you built a parking garage three years ago, you're paying debt service on that parking garage every month and you don't have the parking fees, right? Now, if, if right. you're a student or a staff member, faculty member, parking fees are a drag and you don't want to pay them. But the flip side is, how are you going to pay off that $8 million a year you've got to, to finish paying for that parking structure? I mean, these are very real concerns. So some campuses just said, we got to bring everybody back. We got to bring it back as fast as possible. And then they would tell themselves, and everybody misses it. Everybody is like me. Everybody wants to be back on campuses. Well, everybody's not like you. Um, some people have looked at the last two years and said, this is a revelation. I don't always need to be there. I can do a lot of what I do remotely and I'm taking care of my family. I've got children. I've got elderly parents. I cook for my dad every night. I've got a job. I go to work at four in the morning. I get home at, at two. I need to take a nap. I can't take a 10 o'clock class. I mean, there's all these are think realities. Yeah. This work-life balance thing has really come to the front of being right. a high priority for people. That's right. And so, so if it works well online, it's probably more, it's probably more accessible to more people. And by the way, it's a lower carbon footprint, so um, which is you know a big deal to to all of us. So um, you know, do it face to face if there's value. And frankly, a lot of instruction, in particular, if you're going to do basically information delivery instruction, frankly, LinkedIn Learning does that quite well without you having to be in the same place at the same time. I mean, I learned that from Linda a long time ago. But there are, there are also many types of instruction where it's incredibly valuable to be in a small group or face-to-face -face or working at something hands-on. You know, my daughter's studying art at Cal State LA. She doesn't want to take a photography class online. She wants to be in the photo lab with the other students and with the lab tech and the instructor. You know, she, she doesn't want to do her drawing class by herself in her room. She wants to be there with other people and be getting, and having the instructor like watch her draw the line and give her feedback in real time or, or look at the art on the wall, which looks different than looking at people's pictures that people took with their phones. So, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not an advocate of a world where we do everything online. I don't think that 
for most people, an entirely online education is the ideal, although for some it might be the best that they can get because of their lives or their capabilities. But, um, but don't just go back to doing it face-to-face -face because that's the way you used to do it. That's what I was trying to say. Now, like some people said, well, this is oversimplistic. There's a lot of factors. Of course there are. You can't make a flowchart with one decision point and have it represent you know, all the choices in the world. I, I know there's a lot of subtlety to this. But my point was really, you know, in most cases, online should be the default now, not face-to-face. -face. Yeah, and I think it's just idea, um, there's a lot of, a lot of data now is coming out about this very successful data about measuring students, how they liked it. And students like a lot of the online yeah. experiences. There's a lot of it that was great. It, it gave them better voice, more, more uh, interaction in, in small groups, uh, things that they hadn't had in a classroom that they're very hard to set up, sometimes just physically because of the classroom. So um, this, I think students see it as a mixture of choices, not as a one choice world. And that's where you're, you're talking about as we, as we as leaders put things out, are we giving a spectrum of the cafeteria line? Or are we making it a black and white thing? So this is my favorite post of Michael's. Uh, and I, of course, put it into this PowerPoint. Um, he posted this as re recently as well. It's kind of his strategy, which I have used many times in the last two, two months, actually, myself. It's called 3Ds plus one, but I'll let him walk you through it. Sure, I was just, it was conversations that came out of other IT leaders and um, and then you know it's helpful I think when you when you do these things if you can create a uh, again this is super oversimplified right but it, it's it's to to give you a, a start of a framework to think about how to make these decisions we all have too much to do whether in our lives or in, or in our work and so how do we decide where how to set our priorities and I think we have to look at look at the things that that are on our paths and again so many of my colleagues with uh, this this um, 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 the, the particularly in the last six months, just the, the list is un incredibly long. The, people give you to-dos that are just, you just can't do. Plus you got fewer people because people are resigning, retiring, plead guilty on that. P people are leaving, so you don't have everybody you had before. So how do you decide what to do? And it's, it's overwhelming when you look at it. So I suggested this, this 3D model of see what you can defer, you know, it's just, you know, yeah, it's a good thing. Probably you need to do it, but let's just put it aside. And by the way, sometimes you defer something long enough, you realize you never really had to do it anyway. Um, delay, you know, you know, you're going to have to do it, but um, let's let's push it back. And then the things would, just, and then do the things you have to do and focus on those. Um, it's 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 really tough um, uh, to make those decisions, but this is just a way to get started and hopefully break that log jam of oh my god, I've got 800 things on my to do list. What do I do next? And so, you know, a, a reasonable approach is to go through that list and just put deferred, delay, deploy by all of them. Then you look at how many you've got on deploy. You've probably still got too many. You go back and maybe with a tougher lens. Um, just a suggestion of w w one one model that some people might find helpful. And I'm glad. I'm really glad, Lori, that you found it helpful. I'm happy for anyone's found it helpful. Nothing no, ter it, terribly it, original about it, but I'm just trying to simplify a, a, pro a uh, process that 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 you need to use. I think it works really well with teams. I've put it up before when we have to make some decisions as a group, as a team, uh, figuring out what we're gonna do in the next quarter and um, what we can get done, what we have the time to do, what we have the resources to do. And this has been really helpful because it still allows for brainstorming, but at the same time, it kind of puts things into a, a hierarchical order so that you know that your idea isn't off the table, it's just in a new location on the timeline. And I think, that keeps the team from feeling like they weren't heard or despondent, this will never happen. So yeah. I found it particularly important for, for teamwork, understanding why we were doing what we're doing today and that, yes, I heard you and we will address these other things. So I I'm almost to say, Just a quick shout out, Laurie, to LinkedIn. I mean, it's a nice platform for posting these kinds of things. So I appreciate it. It makes a nice blog kind of platform where you can get a lot of attention I get a lot of yeah. comments and attention and responses. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very nice platform for that. 
Right. I think I think that's the great thing about it. It's it's a safe platform for it's a trusted network and you know it's going to be a professional space. Um, as I always say, we don't do political advertisements or ads. We don't allow that. And we really want it to be a dialogue amongst people about their what they're doing and learning from work and what they're learning through their their career and life life experiences. I've got a couple more questions, and then we're gonna to go to our attendees. You have a lot to say about the future of education. What do you forecast? What do you hope to see? Or do you what do you feel needs to happen, especially now that you're almost ready to vacate your current position? Well, you know, I see. I, I'm, I was just looking at some of the questions that people are asking, um, and I think I touched on it before. Um, uh, we're going to be uh, learning. It's pretty clear to most of us. It's going to be more online than it was in the past. I mean, it's continued. It's moved that way. You know, even if you look back about uh, pre-COVID and you look at the enrollment trends over ten years you can see that all the growth in higher education was online. There was really no, essentially nationwide, no growth uh, in face-to-face, -face, probably slight shrinkage overall. We've seen the last two years a real shrinkage, especially, you know, and worryingly in the community colleges. Um, and um, so those, obviously it's a dynamic world. Those things are changing, the economy keeps changing. We don't, I'm not much at predicting the future. I think you just you just look at the trends that are already here and you can see that we're going to be more online. Does that mean the end to face-to-face -face instruction? I think that's a, probably never going to happen. Um, I think it's very far off. But do we need the number of uh, institutions um, and classroom spaces that we have now uh, 10 or 20 years from now? Quest, very questionable. Um, and again, that's going to be a really difficult change and it's going to affect institutions very differently. I, again, I've never been one saying we're going to see a massive number of institutions going out of business. I think there's a lot of reasons why they don't go out of business. But um, I do think that there's going to be more choices. Um, I th and I think that's going to threaten some of the traditional institutions. And I'm a big fan of traditional institutions. That's where I've worked my whole career. Um, so it's not that I don't like what they do. I really admire what, you know, all our Cal States do and what they do face to face. But I don't think that's going to ever grow the way it did before. Um, and we're going to have to try to figure out how to deal with it and, and still reach our students effectively. As someone said, you know, online is difficult for a lot of students. So but if that's if the alternative is no post-secondary education, how do we figure out how to do that better, to reach them better, to get them the tools that they need to be successful? Because it may not be the alternative. You, you, you know, the alternative for most students is not, uh, I, went, I, I was very privileged. I went to Pomona College and I had an in-person liberal arts education. Wonderful experience. For a lot of reasons, that's just not an alternative for most students in America. It's just not gonna happen. They're not gonna all go to Pomona College. It has 2000 students. I was very fortunate and very privileged. Would I would like every student to have that opportunity? Absolutely, but it's not realistic. It's not going to happen. So, the alternative is not Pomona College, um, or um, or nothing. The alternative is Pomona College or other ways, community colleges, state colleges, online, large institutions like Southern New Hampshire or Western Governors, smaller online programs like many of the CSUs offer. Um, there are a lot of alternatives. It's confusing for students. Um, you know, shout out to anyone who does counseling. It's incredibly important. That's what my mother did was college counseling. You know, students need help. I don't think that um, while there's a place for chatbots and AI, I don't. Again, I don't think it's going to replace human mentors for a very long time, if if ever. So, getting people the good human mentors think, that they need to help them. I do think there's going to be a shift that we see in the community colleges and the state universities, where one of the things we learned is that. I know at the community colleges, so many of the people were front frontline workers and had to deal with their children being home and educating them. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty hard to be a frontline worker, educate your children at home by Zoom and attend a college campus. Pretty hard so I just, is an understatement, yeah. Yeah, so, and if you were doing this as a single parent, oh my God. So uh, just putting that out there. So one of the things that I liked, I, I just did a workshop with a bunch of the CSU work, uh, CSU schools, they were thinking about, you know, we really do need to address uh, child care, child services that, that, that making it possible. We really do need to address the fact that uh, this is a future thinking thing. 
that careers and skills you need for, you know, we can't just do the T model anymore because your job description may just disappear, but you do could be developing skills and have passions at the same time, like Michael's been doing, that allow you to keep relevant. And that will make a CSU system or a public state university system the return to learn. It will be the center for lifelong learning because it's going to be attached to community and not to, oh, do my parents have enough money to send me to Pomona? Or, oh, do I have enough money to do uh, you know, a very expensive program here or there? And that's a really big deal of this matching the university system with community and culture and health and education and the values that you want for your family. And I think that's where state universities have a real role in the future to be, we're here, we can do it, we're already existing. I, I, I'm, I'm very... I'm very positive about the role of public universities and community colleges. I, I think they will be a huge benefit for this ever change. This We're never going to quit changing as fast as we're changing. It's going to continue to happen. And, so and one by more- the way, By the way, shout out to liberal education because I think at its best, what a liberal arts education was designed to do was to create a flexible and adaptive learner who can adjust over time. And um, I, that that, I hope that more students get that. Now, maybe it's it's you know it's not going to be in person for four years necessarily, but the values that are embodied in that, which are by the way are carried out, you know, on a daily basis at many Cal State, at all Cal States, in in, in many areas across them. Um, you know, I hope we 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 figure out a way to help students get those skills, and not just the so-called employable um, skills. You know, um, right? I think- but I think. There's value yeah, but, in having, you know, focus on training people to become cloud technicians or. Exactly, exactly. You know, I'm not and, against that, but but there's there's a, there's it should be a time in your learning where you you learn how to become a flexible learner and a critical thinker um, and figuring out a way to do that, that that is is flexible and that that and, and having society really value that type of education is really important to me. We did a survey of people starting entry level jobs here at LinkedIn and the three, the top three are not, the top one is work-life balance, will it afford me that? Number two was payment and benefits. Number three was, will they continue to educate and grow me? <laughs> will yeah. you grow me as a person? <laughs> and yeah. uh, that's that's where I see the partnerships that, that, that CSUs and other state universities could really have, have a, a key benefit with the employees and the communities that they work with. So just to say, he, if you don't know this, Michael is about to retire officially, although unofficially, I think you are open to consulting. I wanted to mention that if anyone wants a really great, innovative mind, it's, he's really fun to think through problems with, and he's doing a lot more music gigs. So if you're not, you, you should be following him because more and more, he's got a ponytail, he hasn't demonstrated he hasn't swung it around for you to see but he's got a ponytail he's you can see he's got his guitar in the background I'm smiling. So he's, he's he's smiling um he's he's going for like a flex, flexible thing but i wanted to let you know he's not out of higher ed so anna let's go to the q a and hear what um people want to hear from michael Sure thing. And thanks everyone for submitting your questions we've had a number come through q a in the chat so you've talked about this um, but just one clarification, I'll group our first two questions together. Uh, we'll love your thoughts on CSU's expanding online course offerings. Someone sees this as a potential um, opportunity to help with people stopping or dropping out of their programs. And similarly, someone was curious if you have seen any data come through supporting the hybrid model in terms of gains to student success, completion, and equity. Great, thank you, Anna. Good questions. Um, there are pockets in the CSU. There are individual campuses that have pretty fantastic online course offerings in certain areas, and I know that we have several of these sort of degree completion programs that are targeted at students that have a lot of units but haven't been able to graduate for whatever reason, and we help create a program for them to graduate online. Um, so we're doing that. We're going to do more of it. Um, will there be the question? I think is will there be an initiative system wide to do that? You know, re, you know, there was a kind of uh, attempt that was probably too early and not fully enough thought out. That was called Cal State Online, that didn't really go anywhere for all kinds of reasons. Um, will there be a system wide approach to it? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think that a lot of the you know again. In the innovation and the thinking about instruction and curriculum tends to come from the campuses and not on not centrally. 
The question is, I think from a competitive point of view, as you see Arizona State set up operations in the state of California, as you see Southern New Hampshire, which by the way, I'm a big fan of theirs and a lot of what they do, um, you know, advertising in California, um, should, Calif should the CSU take a different strategy and have a more aggressive outreach and, and strategy run online? My guess is that we, we will, the, I, I, you know, again, it's not gonna be up to me. I think those discussions are taking place and will continue to take place. And I'm not really sure what the CSU will do because we're not, again, we're not really set up, say like Arizona State, where you've got one large institution that serves a very large number of students with one very um, activist president. We've got a lot of institutions and in that environment, um, I don't know what's gonna happen, but there will be more online. There's absolutely no question about it because there already is. And um, uh, previous chancellor was uh, supportive of that. And I think future chancellors, well, as well, our new, our new interim chancellor, Jolene Kester is actually quite a, a visionary in terms of technology and did a lot of interesting things when she was at Northridge 10 years ago. So I know this is gonna be a big topic of conversation. You know, as far as high flex system wide, I would say no, um, it's really been a campus decision um, there's been, again, some support for training and strategy and technology system-wide for campuses that want to do that. Um, but, you know, HyFlex model was born in, in, in this, uh, that name was coined by Brian Beatty at um, San Francisco State University. So it was born in San Francisco State. But he was talking about adult graduate students when he created that model. And then that idea has been expanded into a lot of different directions. The name's been used for for a lot of things that probably don't really fit, even fit the original vision that, that those folks have. So, and since some quarters it's gotten a bad rap, um, I think implemented poorly, it can create a huge burden on faculty. So I, I don't really see modality uh, at that level of specificity being a statewide initiative. It might be supported if that's what campuses need support, but I would say my guess would be no. Again, it's not up to me and I don't, I don't, I'm not the decision maker on any of that. I want to be clear, but um, that would be my prediction just from what I know about the CSU. From what we know at LinkedIn through our data on the university pages for the CSU system, there's a lot of loyalty of the alums to the university they attended. Right. And, and they're very loyal because it serves the community. And as you said, ASU is a one state, one school. <laughs> That's really- well, they, do have other, right. they do have other campus. There are other universities in in, uh, right, right. But I'm just saying that they do, but I'm just saying Michael Crow has built it that to be that way. Whereas right, right. The, the CSU system is built on serving the, the completely diverse geographical, economical yep. uh, regions. And uh, we're, we just see that there's a lot. We see that people don't see one as better than the other, but that, that they're very loyal to the one that, that served them and helped them get their degree and help them go from school to work. They're very, very, very pro. Yep. Uh, that's one of the pieces of information we can say about the CSU system. Um, whereas maybe somebody came from the East Coast to attend UC Berkeley and then went back to MIT. And now, you know, like we don't see that kind of migration as much in the CSU system. So I think that again, that speaks to what public universities and colleges can do for uh, for the community or where people choose to live and build their lives. Yep. Uh, another question, Anna? Yes, so we had a question. If it is more of a decision tree question or about designing optimal spaces before deciding between traditional classroom, creative lab, offsite, virtual, et cetera, how can we take the best of online into various experience models? This person yeah. mentioned that classroom booking hierarchies uh, can be bimodal at many universities. Well, first of all, my shout out to those people who are working on the front lines of supporting classroom technology. Man, what a difficult job. Um, so underappreciated. Um, you're always told when it doesn't work and you, you don't get too many calls. With people saying, hey, thanks. I, I went in the projector and I did my class and everything worked perfectly. Thank you. You don't get too many of those. So <laughs> it's really tough. Uh, on many campuses, it's siloed. You have different, you know, the, the, you have deans and colleges making decisions. You have you might have a central IT or academic technology unit that's making some of the decisions, but they can't make all of them. Or they might have a standard, but they don't have funding for it. So then other people come in and say, oh, we got this great idea. We're going to build this other kind of classroom. So, but you can support it for us. So, I mean, 
I, I think that if you had a campus where you really had a had a, um, governance around how classrooms were done, then I would recommend getting together the leadership in your campus, getting the enrollment services folks, getting the de deans, and, and usually it's usually the associate and assistant deans who actually really know what's going on, and saying, okay, let's map out what we think, and really, really hard right now, because we're just on, there's so much change going on, but what do we really think enrollment is gonna look like on this campus X years in the future? How much of it's gonna be in person? What types of courses? So, you know, look at your academic plan if you've got a good current academic plan. And then come up with a plan for the classrooms, knowing you're going to be wrong because you can't predict what it's actually going to be. But um, so, you know, having a very rational, um, thought out model for how to uh, enhance and support your classrooms over the next five years is a really attractive idea. I don't think many campuses have the right culture or organizational maturity, at least the ones I know in the CSU, but I don't think it's that different most places to do that, unfortunately. And so what's going to happen is a lot of different people are going to make those decisions. There's going to be a lot of waste and people are going to build things that no one uses. Um, and I've been on many, I, I remember once being on a tour at a campus I shall not name and being shown classroom after classroom uh, along with a representative of a major technology firm. And finally he leaned over to me and he said, he said, you know, I'm really tired of these tours of empty classroom, of empty tech classrooms. Like if they're so great, why aren't, isn't anyone using them? You know, so exactly, exactly. <laughs> at the end of the day, the, the, the technology has to work with the for the faculty and the students who are in the room for the teaching that that and learning activity that they want to go on there. I think that the 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 idea that you're going to make every classroom so that it can be easily used by faculty to teach those students who are there and those students who are remote in this what's sometimes represented as a high flex model is just not practical for most faculty for most courses and for most institutions um, you can have a few of those rooms but to, to say well we're just gonna make every room so the students can either be there or not be there well if you do a lot of them are just not going to be there um, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily gonna have a good learning experience so um, reality is good and 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 collaborative rational decision making is good and I'd like to see more of it <laughs> I've seen well, right, and I, the alternative on my uh, in my uh, I, experience. I think this is where we're seeing uh, the rise of the CXO the student experience person I mean what if you're taking two zoom classes that are three hours long back to back and then you're supposed to go to a lab someplace I mean you you, you have to re really imagine what is the day of that student what's that what's that like to be that we're student? not very good at that in most traditional institutions, right? Because we tend to know, make but that's but those are the choices. I, I get it, but you know, if the department chair in one department decides, and then the department chair in another department decides, who looks at the student experience, right? And so, you know, God bless somebody becomes a student experience expert because a lot of time they're going to be tilting at windmills. I think, right? It's like yeah, because I think everybody knows. It's like yeah, I hear what you're saying, but this is what the faculty in this department decided to do and we can, we have no way to change it. So, and, th and this is where I do think that the more um, innovative and top-down institutions, frankly, have some advantages in, in doing that, but there's there's disadvantages there as well, so. Right, and you, you guys deliver to a huge audience. I mean, you serve thousands, literally tens and thousands of students. So well, we, we, we normally have uh, between 450 and 500,000 students. Right, which is a lot. So we we're have doing time things for at scale, but but one at a time. No, I know you are, and and, and actually, but fairly, fairly adaptably. I mean, you're not. It's you don't and have very inexpensively, to frankly. So okay. yeah, no. I, they say they say it, that for the cost per student, CSUs deliver one of the highest quality education in the world. And I really do believe, believe that. I do too, uh, Anna. We've got time for one more question. Absolutely. So our next uh, two questions both touched on this, so I'll group them. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll love your general thoughts about the importance of DEI when it comes to higher ed technology and innovation. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that question. Um, you know, I think there was a time when um, the consensus in, in techno technology folks, and I would have put myself in that area, was that, well, we, we, we think DEI is good. We're in favor of it, but it really has nothing to do with technology. Let someone else figure it out. There's an office of DEI on campus and they do that. And we're just going to sit here and be technology people. And I think we finally got over that delusion and realized that if you're not part of the uh, solution, you're part of the problem. And that 
those of us who are leaders in in technology and um, and all the leaders that I really admire um, are really working and and not just talking about but actually working in concrete ways to improve um, representation in in higher ed you know and th that's a whole I think you had a talk recently on that topic I mean I, we I do, can't uh, I'm it comes up all the time. We try to we try to bring it up every three months. <laughs> yeah, I can't I can't do that justice in a short period of time. All I can say is that, in my opinion, everybody at every level in higher education, and I have to say, especially those those of us who are in the more privileged roles, have to be taking this seriously and have to be asking how are decisions we make about hiring, about how people are treated, about how they're brought in and included in an environment, um, about how we work with students. I'll just give you one little example. Here's a practical takeaway for those of you like me who are in sort of ed tech technology. Most of you hire student workers. Take a look at your pipeline of how you hire those student workers because what happens a lot of times is you get some student who comes from a particular department, let's say computer science, and then you have an opening and then they say, oh, I have a friend and I can bring along. And, you know, most people's most of people's friends in their department are going to be people like them in terms of their backgrounds you know so if if you're doing that get out there and figure out how you can diversify your student worker population you try to make your student pop, student worker population if you're fortunate enough to be at a diverse campus like a cal state try to make your student student worker population look like the rest of your population and Make sure those students, make sure all students have equal opportunity to succeed and to, to move up in the organization and get the real meaty jobs in your IT organization because that's the only way in the long run we're gonna change that pipeline. So that's just one thing. There's many, many things you can do, but the, the transformative leaders that I know are looking at that and not accepting the, well, you know, we had Sam last year and we had Bill and then we had Mike and then we had Don, well, you know, what about Judy and Sarah and Ramona, you know, you, you, you've got to diversify in terms of, of um, gender in IT is a huge issue, <clears throat> but also obviously in terms of race and background, try to see if you can't make your student workers at least start to look more like the rest of your, your, um, your student population. And then at the same time, work on the rest of your staff. But that, that takes a long time because especially in higher education, people come and they stay for 20, 25, 30 years. So that's a very slow process, but you got to be looking at it with every hire you do. So let me just I, put that out there and say that that's an absolute responsibility for all of us. And especially, frank, frankly, for the white guys like me to make sure that that the that when we leave, that the 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 organizations are more diverse than when we came. I think that was a really good tip. I mean, it's just a self-awareness exercise to ask if the decision I'm making mirroring me or is it is it is it opening it up you know like yep. like you know it's just looking at each uh, one of those decision points and asking yourself that michael it's been so great to have you here again he's not disappearing he's going to be playing guitar singing songs writing songs and he's open for consulting you've it's just been a fabulous insight into how you're looking at this huge educational system and what your leadership skills are. Really appreciate you being here. Again, if letting you know at LinkedIn Learning, we have a lot of courses around a lot of the topics that um, Michael talked about. We're always looking at ways in IT, I think, to create inward mobility for these diverse teams so that they can move out into leadership positions. And that's one thing I think that we think about all the time at LinkedIn. Are we moving women up into more leadership positions? Are we moving people and giving them those opportunities? So those are some things to think about. Um, Next month, we'll be having a totally different spin. We're going suddenly virtual, suddenly hybrid. Uh, my good friend, Karen Reed, who does uh, presentations on how to give meetings, how to do leadership meetings, is going to talk about how leaders can be more effective in a hybrid meeting. Not, we all know that you're pretty good in the, in the room at the table, but this is really to look at what we can do in hybrid meetings to lead teams more strategically. She's written a number of books. She's actually been a newscaster on television and her, her uh, work in training people for this has actually been adopted by the MBA program at Stanford. Uh, she's a wonderful person. She's exquisite to hear and a fabulous presenter. Are you surprised? Uh, so I hope you join us. That will be on uh, April 14th. And then we have all of our old recordings available on the site. 
uh, highereducationleaders.splashthat.com. Welcome you all to come back anytime and look at any of them. They're all really wonderful. I feel like it's a collection of just wonderful brains and minds around topics that really do help me think. I, there's not a, one of these that I come to that it doesn't shift my thinking a little bit and make me think and re- just like when Michael said, re rethink how I'm doing things. Can I do it better? Can I serve the people that I'm trying to serve better? Um, I, I really love what you did today, Michael, emphasizing, always keep in mind, who are we serving? <laughs> Why are we doing this? A really important thing. And then if you do that, it makes your work feel purposeful and you stay at a place like Cal State University or Pasadena City College or Link LinkedIn Learning for a long, long time because you really believe in what you're doing. Thank you all. That's a wrap. Let's give Michael a great big hand.